Uh, but I'm Corey Coleman. Martin Thomas is joining me hey, today. Yeah, I made it. And I'm very happy and I'm very, I'm, I'm very honored to have Mr. Keith David here on the show. You know, I, I probably don't have to tell you that much about Keith David. The man is pretty much an icon when it comes to the world of entertainment, possibly some other places. Uh, just to you know, let every, everybody know what's coming up with him. And, and uh, Keith, we're going to get to you and talk to you uh, very shortly. But I just want to let people know some things that are coming up for you. Uh, one, uh, we have 21 Bridges coming up with Chadwick Boseman. That'll be out very soon. That's a... Uh, the latest motion picture that he'll be in. You can see him right there. And also on his fourth season is the Oprah produced show, Greenleaf. I don't know if you watched that. No, is that on the own network? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so uh, that is coming up in its. You should. What's that? If you don't watch it, you should. Yeah, it sounds like a threat. Accused <laughs> <laughs> of arson, negligent like manslaughter, and still owes the IRS two million back taxes. Your family is this church's biggest problem. Good to know. By the way, that is not his first time working with uh, Oprah Winfrey. They also worked together in a TV movie, uh, There Are No Children Here, where he played a, uh, a father trying to get back with his kids. Of course, Oprah was the mother right there. You are, I'm going to tell you something right now. You're probably one of the hardest people to interview, and that is because of your accomplishments. You know, if you just go and look at your IMDb page, which I'm looking at right now. You mean pages? That, that is like reading a novel. It's like reading the Bible. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. It is like I can't even keep up with it. It's kind of hard to figure out how to put an interview together like that when there's so much ground to cover. But I'll just say this. You have, uh, you've, been, you've, been, uh, uh, you've been blessed with it all. You know, you have a great voice. You've got, you got a, 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 a physicality that demands authority. Uh, yet you can be charming and sweet-natured at the same time. Uh, you know, this has allowed you to transcend uh, race almost with your roles. Mm. A lot of people, you know, you just take roles that don't really depend on what color you are. I mean, there are roles that you have had like that. Uh, but I guess I want to get into the questions right now. Has there ever been a role that you turned down maybe because it was too stereotypical or you felt that it was – a little too racial for you in the wrong way. Um, yes, absolutely. Um, I made an executive decision many years ago in my life not to play uh, a black man as stereotyp you know, as stereotypical the way we have been mostly portrayed in movies and TV. And once, I mean, I, I, don't, I don't think we need to necessarily get into specifics, but let me say there was a TV show that had been on for maybe 12 years. And they finally, and, you know, and I was living in New York at the time and I thought, wow, it's kind of a, it's, you know, and sometimes people would ask me, have you ever been on this show? And I said, no, I've never been on that show. So finally, after 12 years, I was asked to be on the show. But it was to play a man who was being indicted for um, allegedly raping his 16-year-old daughter, stepdaughter, and he, to which he completely denied it. And uh, come to find out when they put him in jail. Now, you know, when I read it, I read it as... Um, uh, uh, coercion, or uh, um, there's another there's another word for it, uh, um, entrapment, uh, because the police are allowed to lie if they think they can get to the truth. So they told this man, who had married a woman with a child, and he always wanted a child of his own, uh, but his new wife didn't want any more children. So they told this man that the girl who he was allegedly supposed to have raped that she was having a child. And suddenly he changed his story to say that, is she going to have a baby? Oh, is she, and, and it's going to be mine? <laughs> <laughs> and, 
and, and huh. so, it, I mean, it was just, you know, um, I saw nothing redeeming in this man. Nothing. There was nothing. Of, there was nothing about, you know, a, you know, a man who rapes his sixteen-year-old stepdaughter. You can't come back from that. Yeah, that's true. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it, it, you know, yeah, it's pretty damn hard too. You know, nothing to exonerate. So, you know, I remember asking one of my old acting teachers. And he said, well, man, it's just a part. You know, I mean, you know, if they offer you the part, go ahead and play the part. And I and, and my mother was like, oh, no, I don't want to see you do that. And I was like, well, my, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's a part, you know. And I finally decided it was in that category of men whom I decided not to play. There was nothing redeemable about this man. Mm -hmm. Now, I mean, there are men who are unredeemable. I'm not afraid to play that. But to... Add to the, uh, you know, litany of black men that you know, uh, uh, as as seen by, as seen by most of at least white society, as being a scallywag. I wasn't going to do that. Yeah, as you have, uh, I've seen them in, in so many different roles. Yeah, and even in the roles where they do seem like they are, their stereotypical roles that there are roles that would be negative for a person of color, especially a black man. Uh, he has brought some kind of charisma and authority to those roles. Well, I was thinking about that because we were just re-watching The Princess and the Frog, where he's the villain. Well, and yeah, in that, but I'm thinking of uh, something but, else here where he's, uh, because I'm thinking about Dead Presidents. You know, if you watch Dead Presidents, you know, he's, he is a gangster. Yeah. Uh, but if you watch... Uh, if you watch how he portrays that character, there is still some, even as as vile as his character may be, there's, there, there is some authoritative and almost self-respecting thing about the man. Come here. Oh! <laughs> oh man, Kurt. Oh! What the f***? Oh, oh, you, you stupid oh, son of a bitch! Oh, oh, you grabbed the wrong leg, you stupid oh, cocksucker! Oh, <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, and I have to ask you now, I it, it's, uh, it's something about your demeanor that, again, makes you just even transcends roles, roles like that. Do you have any... Did you have do you have any hesitancy about taking a role like that? And given what you said about the role that you didn't want to take before, what is it about a role like you would play uh, in something like Dead Presidents, where you are, uh, you know, pretty much a street gangster? What is it about that role that would allow you to play that? On the page, in the writing, was a man whom you. I mean, there were there were there were several scenes cut from that movie that uh, says, speaks even more to what I'm about to say, which is, in the course of the story, you got to see and understand why he is the way he is. Mm -hmm. So you got to experience some of his humanity. And that is what's important to me. If, if that man that I'm playing reminds you of your uncle or your neighbor, mm -hmm. your dad, mm -hmm. your brother, Somebody you know, a human, me a human being that you know, a person that you know, then you know, I, then I'm, I'm doing my job, you know, because it's not to, not, to, you know, I mean, stereotypes are stereotypes for a reason because there are some people who are like that. Yeah, yeah. But if you, if in the course of a story you understand why he's like that, then you can get a taste of his humanity. When you can understand a man hu man's humanity, you may, you may not agree with his choices, mm -hmm. but you can understand why he made them. Yeah. So so what you're saying is, it's like it's the death of a character because, you know, you see right here in this scene where he, you know, he, he's pointing a gun at somebody. He's he, he hit a woman, but throughout the movie, there is depth to this character. The character is not just a gangster. He's the father figure. You know, he's somebody who's a benefactor to someone. I, so it's kind of the, what you're saying is it's the depth of a character. As long as that character is not shallow in a pure stereotype, then that's what appeals to you. I would put it differently, but that's a, that's a way to put it. Yeah. <laughs> well, how would you put it then? I just, I, that, as I was just explaining, I mean, I mean, you, I mean, you said it the way you say it, but I mean, um, I mean, that's, that, that's true. If I can, if I can find, uh, something, something deeper than, than what's necessarily on the page, mm -hmm. you know, some, something that, that will, uh, you know, show a range of his humanity. Every villain 
every 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 dark character has a sense of humor. Yeah, it may be dark as hell, but there it's there. You may not like it, but it's there. He's you know every every bad guy had a mother. I don't want to you know one one of the things that uh that I don't want to do that I want to avoid doing is I don't want to bring up uh, continuously all of the things that people reference when they're talking about you or when they're around you, maybe, especially if they just met you for the first time. Uh, you know, I, I, one of the things that I will, you know, I'm just going to pull up for context. I'm not going to really play the clip. I'll, I'll show it while, uh, while I'm speaking here is John Carpenter's the thing back in 1982, you played the character of Childs. Uh, that was your first major movie role for people who are familiar with you or really love that movie, uh, they might know. Uh, one of the things, though, that I recognize that a lot of people probably don't mention, or may, or maybe you do hear this very often, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. is if you go to your IMDb page, you will find, uh, if you go right down to the first thing, you know, as far as actor goes, you will see uh, that you are in a film Disco Godfather, you are uncredited as club patron. Now, I got to tell you, uh, that that is one of my absolute favorite movies. I'll uh, show people just a little bit. If you're not familiar with this, uh, it's not the best movie in the world, but it, it definitely is something that is really? highly. It's really? The, <laughs> <laughs> you sure it didn't win the Oscar that year? <laughs> yeah. To, yeah, you had to have been nominated. You weren't nominated, <laughs> but uh, yeah, man. If you if, if 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 you've seen the movie, I just say this: is it's it's damn sure entertaining. <laughs> A lot of people have been asking me ever since I've been, you know, showing them this movie and they've been uh, going in and loving it themselves and researching it. They're like, you know what, man, I looked up this movie and I did all kind of research. And one of the things that I saw is that it is Keith David's first credited film. Uh -huh. <laughs> but where the hell is he? <laughs> you know, I can't find him. First of all, do you even remember making that movie? Because you've made so many things. Absolutely not. <laughs> and then I gotta bring it up. <laughs> oh well, you can throw in that page of questions you now. You put it up because I would never have. <laughs> well, IMDb remembers. <laughs> the internet remembers. Uh, it, only, it, it only shows you that IMDb can be wrong. Now, are they wrong? I mean, listen. You know, I mean, early in earlier in my career, uh, when you're just starting out, and somebody asks you to be, uh, you know an extra in a movie or, or something, you know, I mean, I, I don't remember, I don't remember Disco Godfather. Uh, <laughs> if I was in it uh, as an extra, you know, who knows what the title was before it mm. became Disco Godfather. Yeah, it actually many, did have another title, Avenging Disco Godfather. Right. <laughs> I don't remember ever doing a movie called Disco Godfather, but that doesn't <laughs> do it but, uh, I, I defy you to find me <laughs> and you know what i can't man no one can everybody especially people no. been trying to look up this interview like i even took screenshots i'm like well you know that could be keith david back there i'm not sure you know people are even looking back here they're like well that guy with shades on looks like a young keith david who knows um i am i am not um the only person who uh and that is not that is not the worst movie I have been cut out of. Or the best. <laughs> <laughs> we talk about things like uh, uh, the the thing from 1982, which again is a John Carpenter classic. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, again, where people remember you as the character of Childs, where you uh, you know had a lot of memorable scenes. Not you know you, you didn't have a whole lot of dialogue and a lot of scenes, but you had some great moments, especially at the at the end with uh, Kurt Russell. You the only one who made it? Where were you, Charles? Got lost in the storm. You know, it's a great scene because it does play on the theme of paranoia in that movie so so well. And, and, that, and it's still, to this day, ambiguous. Even John Carpenter said, whatever you think you know about this ending, you're wrong. No one knows. Well, it's, it's also <laughs> special because it's one of the few movies where a black guy lives to the end. Yeah, I was just going to bring that up. You know, that is one of the, I think that is why a lot of people uh, also love that movie because... 
you know, again, adding to your character in this film, yeah, you know a lot of people, even at that time, were just happy to see, even if it's an ambiguous ending, well, they were just happy to see that you made it, man. Well, that was a great thing about... That was a great thing about doing that movie as well. It was my first movie, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and I lived. And, you know, <laughs> and we, and we, you know in, term, in terms of... You mentioned stereotype in terms of you know in terms of our history in movies, especially in horror movies or sci-fi movies, we never live to the end. Mm -hmm. We are, we're always we're always the you know almost the first to be gotten rid of. Yeah, I'm sorry, I can't think of it right. What was the movie I did with Vin Diesel? Uh, oh, Vin oh, Diesel. Vin Diesel. Uh, no, not, not the Chronicles of Riddick, the first one. Pitch dark. Oh, uh, pitch, uh, pitch black. Pitch, pitch black. Pitch Black. And, you know, it's very rarely mentioned when we talk about it. But when you when you think about we're leaving the planet Earth to explore territories mm -hmm. in space. Mm -hmm. And the one religion that survives is Islam. That's right. That was your character yeah. in the movie. Yeah. We go and Islam, you know, you know, goes out into the universe, and uh, and in in Pitch Black, I did survive. I mean, I died later on in Chronicles of Riddick, but I did survive. That's right. Yeah, you survived one movie. That's <laughs> that counts for a lot. It does. Well, he's got now he's got two. And he was a and, and he was a Muslim. Mm -hmm. So you know that. Yeah. that uh, do you uh, is that is that something that uh appealed to you in the script when you saw it too? Was that, was that a big, uh, did I play a big factor in you choosing that part? It played a factor. I mean, you know, I mean, I, I mean, I, I loved it. I mean, it. First of all, it gave me a chance to, you know, to really be a character because I really wanted to, I mean, I started, I started studying Islam. I started studying, um, Arabic because mm -hmm. I really want, I wanted, I wanted to, I wanted to at least, uh, I wanted to be someone who spoke English mm -hmm. as a second language again you know you have uh, been someone who uh again has transcended a lot of uh a lot of images for black people and people of color at that time now here's something interesting so uh, you know you come from you come from uh uh uh, uh the thing which is uh 1982 now a lot of and in 1983 you go and you do something that a lot of people might assume you would have done before uh, the thing, because for one thing, you you know, in the thing, we we see you as uh, we see you as this uh, you know, this 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 tough guy, the imposing guy, again, a, a guy that's able to take care of himself with authority, uh, and then you turn around in 1983, right after that, and we see you playing the kindest, gentlest, sweetest person on one of the kindest, gentlest, and sweetest shows, Mr. Rogers. Hi. Hello. Hi, I'm Keith. I come to collect from the Mr. See, I thought you were about to beat Mr. Rogers' ass. <laughs> <laughs> I come to collect my money. <laughs> yeah. You have been paying. <laughs> even, Mr. even Mr. Rogers looks terrified right your, now. Your envelope was light this week. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm Fran. Glad Hi. to meet you, Keith. And this is Brandon. Hi, Brandon. I'm going to collect all the money you put in. You kids like, take it. <laughs> I'm not going to stop you. Uh, you know, that's uh, also you... Um, you in the land of make believe, you know, uh, a character there, you know, with the puppets and everything. Um, how do you go from? Because uh, some people even look at it like, okay, you made this this big movie, your next project is going to be a big movie. And it probably was, but a lot of people might even wonder how do you go from uh, make that transition from uh, doing something like a horror science fiction film where you play a, play a tough action guy, uh, and the thing to doing something like a kid show such as Mr. Rogers. What you're asking me about is the course of my career. Mm -hmm. Over the course of a career, you do a lot of things. I didn't make any decisions about, oh, you know, I'm not gonna do anything but play lead parts. I'm, I'm, I'm not going to, you know, I'm, I'm only gonna play black men. I'm only gonna play roles that, I, I didn't make any of those kinds of decisions. Mm -hmm. I, you, know, you know, when you ask me what, I, what, you know, what I like to do or what I like to do best, I like to work. And Mr. Rogers was the sweetest, most gracious man I've ever met. He was just a wonderful guy. And when you, when you think about it, Mr. Rogers 
was a Presbyterian minister. Mm -hmm. And his ministry was to children, you know, like K through sixth grade. He was just remark. I mean, I, I felt I felt really I felt really honored to be on that show because I had a friend, I had a friend at the time, who had what we would now call autistic. Mm -hmm. In those days, he was they called him hyperactive or yeah. something like that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, and and he would and he was he was one of those kids, who was like all over you know, all over the place, busy, busy, always talking, always you know running around. But when Mr. Rogers came on, he was <laughs> riveted to the television and listening intently. That's the effect that Mr. Rogers had on him. And if you came into the room that he was watching the TV and made a sound, because if you said, if you said, uh, if you said, you know, Brian, it's time to even <laughs> Mr. Rogers is on. And it was, it was incredible to see that. I think that's a real honor to have met Mr. Rogers. I think out of some of the things, out of mm -hmm. all the people that you would actually mention throughout your, you know, your your time and your career, uh, a lot of people would be like, "Wow, that's amazing that you actually were able to, uh, at some point, interact with Mr. Rogers." Mm -hmm. Well, I think so. And then, I, and, and one time I ran into him, I ran into him on the street sometime after that uh, in Soho, I think it was, mm -hmm. and and he remembered me. And he was he was so glad to see me and to say hello and remind me about what a good time uh, it was to have me on the show, and and, and I just I, I just felt so honored. That was that's the word. I was I was honored and, and I felt privileged. It was just it was great because he was, you know, what he did was profound. Uh, and one of the things that I think people see with you also is that in your charisma, you are also somewhat a very fatherly type person too. Uh, and, 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 you know, I kept using authority. To, what's older. that? Yeah, that's because I've lived long enough to get old. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> well, let's see, be careful. Somebody's going to say grandfatherly. If you <laughs> Listen, I have, I have a 15 year old daughter. You have a 15 year old daughter? And I have a 15 year old daughter. And, and, and when, sometimes when I'm out with her, Somebody will walk up and say, "Oh, is this your granddaughter?" And I'm like, "No." Why are you me? You're like, "No, I'm about to beat your ass." <laughs> hey, hey, man, I gotta tell you that is that is that is good for me to hear because I am 47 and my wife, she is on me right now. She say, "We're gonna work on these kids. We're gonna have a we're gonna have at least one." And uh, she's looking at me like, "Hey, you know," and I and I don't know if you're gonna be up for the job <laughs> because you're nearing 50. Now, you know, I, I and I look at somebody like you, and I I need to play this interview for her <laughs> to okay. see. Well, I mean, listen, because yeah, because my my uh, I think I was 47 when she was born. Okay. Okay. Well, there you go. There you well, go. well, that means yeah. time's up, Corey. Yeah. You got, you got, time. You got time. But see, having money helps with that. You know, when you ain't got no money like me, it's a little bit hard. <laughs> and, that, and and that's all relative, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, it it is. It is. Hey, I'm working on it. <laughs> you trying... wait, if you wait till you have enough money, you'll never do it. That's true. that is true. Well, I guess I better end, uh, end this interview and get home, <laughs> do some work. Now you know what. Um, you better talk to your lady about that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> oh, believe me, she's talking, man. <laughs> she's talking right now. <laughs> I want to get into your voice work real quick because uh, with your voice work, you, 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 which you have re also received much, much recognition for from doing, uh, from doing narration to commercials and documentaries to doing what a lot of people across many generations know you're doing uh, – uh, uh, voices for animated films uh, in video games. You know, like of course, one of your biggest things here we're showing is uh, Dr. Facilier from uh, The Princess and the Frog. This is, this is an amazing character. This is one of my favorite Disney villains mm -hmm. uh, that, that, I've, that I've ever seen here. I suggest we move on to a less Don't you disrespect me, little <laughs> man. Uh, also, you know, Gargoyles is a very popular animated show, also from Disney, that, uh, that he is known for. Uh, also, to let people know, uh, we have him returning to the character of Spawn. Now, he voiced the character of Spawn on HBO. Yeah, that I remember, but I didn't know he's coming back. Yeah, he's coming back, but he's not coming back in the show. Now, maybe. I don't know. They, they might be some of the Spawn project, but he is doing the voice for Spawn 
in Mortal Kombat 11, uh, March 17th, they're, re they're releasing the, uh, the, the, the pack that is coming out with featuring so many of the different villains. I got to tell you, one of the things that people don't mention, I think you don't get enough credit for being Black Panther. Everybody remembers that other Black Panther, but uh, people might, re might remember, man, this dude was Black Panther first. Totally. <laughs> My father gave his life to stop you, Claw. And now his son is prepared to do the same. Jeez. <laughs> you watching that cartoon? I'm like, hey, man. <laughs> <laughs> He's scary as hell in that, man. I thought you should have played uh, T'Challa's father in the movie uh, that came out from Marvel because uh, you did, you know, you, 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 I figured yeah, you, that would be a no-brainer. Yeah, you ever no, get producing it. What's that? I said, too bad you weren't producing it. I yeah. would have had a job. I, hey, man, I put my hat in the ring. They didn't listen to me. But I got your back anytime. <laughs> Once they start listening. Keep those cards and letters coming. Yeah. You know? <laughs> <laughs> now I got more reason to work. I have to do it just for my wife. Now I got to work for him, too. I was wanting to know if, you know, playing, when you're doing voice work, it seems like even in that area, it transcends race even more because at times you don't even play you don't even play a human being. You know, you're getting you're getting cast really for your personality and your voice in that. I don't know if you if if you feel like it's uh as liberating as the way I'm saying it. You know, when you're when you're when you're voice acting, unless you're playing a, a character of a particular ethnicity for a particular reason, you know, then then anybody can play anything. Now, it, you know, having said that, you know, actors act at the same time, you know, because of the history in this country of white people playing black people stereotypically, mm -hmm. it's not, it is not going to fly in this day and age for an actor just to be an actor. So an actor, for a white actor to play a black role uh, when you have a black man that can play it. Um, but but there you know there's some there's some again there are some uh, pieces that address the humanity of the character so it doesn't matter what ethnicity the actor especially when you're when you're doing uh, anim animation mm -hmm. you know but uh, but in the, these days if if the uh, if, if the character is of a particular ethnicity why not find an actor of that of that ethnicity to play it. Be and, and I say that because we have we have been so culturally polarized. I, I can engage my creative imagination differently because I'm not glued to my body. Yeah, I you know I have there, there there is there is the you know I I always like to see an image of the character before I start voicing it because you know if sometimes you'll start to do something and if I knew he looked like that. I might have put a different spin on it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so it's always helpful to to see that first. I'm always in, I'm, I'm interested in how you make the decision to uh, what you lend your voice to because, as I said, there's been so many things, you know, things that people would figure on, commercials, uh, documentaries, shows, and things of that nature. I was really surprised to uh, hear your voice pop up on uh, on a on an album. Uh, the the latest Chance the Rapper uh, album, uh, uh, which uh, I think you did like uh, one of the one of the skits on there. You damn right, we're yeah, doing good. That was fun. We just had four consecutive <laughs> quarters in the black. Are you kidding me? Hey, wait a minute. Where are you going? Excuse me. Uh, uh, Garçon. <laughs> yeah, boy, I'm talking to you. Come here, give me one of them. Now, is that a record? Are you drunk at the bar? <laughs> <laughs> And they just put a, put a mic on you at the time. <laughs> it's a very funny, it's a very funny recording, you know. And it's not the only thing that you've done as far as hip hop goes. You know, you've done, uh, you did uh, the opening for uh, West Side Connection. There's uh, terrorist threats. You know, what is it about uh, these hip hop projects that? And and you know, probably the answer is gonna be, look, man, I work. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah just, just just take that as a stock. Yeah. That, yeah. It's a job. <laughs> yeah. But you know, but yeah, it's a job, that, sure. But there are certain things that, that you can turn that, down at a certain point. What's I'm sorry? That's the short answer. The 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 more involved answer is. Uh, you know, I listen. I listen to some hip hop. I don't like all. I don't like all hip hop. You know, mm -hmm. uh, uh, and mostly because I, you know, uh, 
when it's denigrating to women and calling women all kinds of names. You know, I, I'm not going to pay you 20 bucks to, to be assaulted as such. Yeah. yeah. However, uh, when it's more, when it's, when it's more um, uh, politically oriented and smart, like, I mean, I love Ice Cube. I love Ice Cube mm -hmm. because, I mean, it's not, it, it, it ain't just cussing for cussing's sake. You know, it is not just, it is not just a um, uh, sensationalist, you know, to be, to be sensationalist. He's not, he's not, you know, doing it just for the effect. He actually has something to say. I didn't, you know, I did not know this, and I don't know how many people knew this. I don't know if you knew this, Martin. But uh, I talk about a man that is blessed and has it all. Now, this man is born with a look, a voice, a charisma. A, char a, a charisma. I mean, if that wasn't enough, I mean, I don't know what this. I don't know how much he paid God to give all this, but this man, he also can sing. Mona Lisa, Mona Lisa, men have named you. That's a, that, that is amazing, that man. That is amazing. I mean, I you know I know he sings in The Princess and the Frog, but I had no idea that your voice had that kind of range. You, you know, it's so close to Nat King Cole. It's a, I know you make you make a brother mad. <laughs> this is like what, give something to me, man. You know why you got, why you got it all? Got to hog all the talent. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, is that so? Uh, with the singing career, or you know, is that, is that something that you see yourself uh, you push uh, you see yourself pushing more? Uh, as, uh, as your career goes along, absolutely. And I've been I've been threatening a CD for years, but I'm finally getting to the point. I'm finally at the point where I'm going to put out my CD. Oh, good, so, nice, very nice. Now, in I tell you, man, I uh, I mean, just the way you talk makes a brother melt. Oh. <laughs> you know, it's just, so if you sing and that's going to be yeah. that people are going to eat that up, man. Uh, when did now are you working on this right now? Or is that something that's coming up very soon? I'm currently working on it. I was trying to get it. I was trying to, I was trying to get it out before Christmas. I don't, you know, which was, uh, which was wishful thinking on my part because, you know, because life happens. And mm -hmm. uh, I, I, my plan is to have it out by Valentine's Day. Oh, perfect. Perfect. <laughs> You know what? That's when I'm gonna start working on that baby. <laughs> <You know? laughs> so look that's at that. The, that's the last ingredient you need. <laughs> that is the last thing I need. You, you make a baby, make, make about ten of them. <laughs> Listen to you, man. <laughs> um, at, at least, well, I won't. I'm not gonna go there. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. You gotta go there now. You are, you already yeah. went there. Let's keep going. Make, make sure one yeah. of them is your wife. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I knew he wanted to say it because I thought it too. <laughs> I'll see what I can do. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> a lot of people have asked you this, but I'm going to uh, I'm going to ask you this because I want to know myself since I have you here. That fight from They Live. Mm. This fight went on so long and it, is, it has turned into like a legendary fight. Um, did it, it, it? It was so long. Did you two actually just start fighting each other for real <laughs> at some point? Uh, what what, in, what what was it like to shoot something? Uh, of that nature i hear several questions in that but anyway uh it was it was a wonderful experience i got to, i got to work with uh uh rowdy roddy piper who was a great wrestler himself a great personality uh within the wrestling community uh i got to learn something about you know a couple of real wrestling moves but i mean you know it was all acting man we rehearsed it for two weeks with a wonderful fight choreographer Jeff Imata and uh, I did we did we did everything ourselves I, I appreciate you being here thank you so much for for uh, spending an hour with us I know you're a very busy man and uh, for, for anybody to get I gotta tell you one thing too man you're wrong for that message on your phone I had to What'd call it him it, you call him up and it's like oh oh hey how you doing I'm like uh, Mr. Davis sir we're about to get on he's like uh, I'm not here but <laughs> leave a message and I was like man <laughs> <laughs> I <laughs>